There's a huge global shift that's happening right now that you need to know about. And this stuff is important because these macro trends that we're about to talk about affect everything, especially the stock market. So we're going to explain what it's going to do to stocks and also how you can play it so you could both protect and grow your money. Now, the trend that we're talking about is actually a reversal of another trend that's been going on since post-World War II. It's given companies around the world tons of efficiencies, and it's really driven their stock prices higher. So the trend that we are talking about is globalization. See, for 60 years after World War War one, we witnessed a steady rise in international trade and revolutionary changes in how products are made and sold. And you guys already know this, right? Everything got shipped to China, all the manufacturing, all of that. And not just China, but supply chains extended all over the world. So today, through a complex network of suppliers, a single smartphone or appliance contains parts sourced from many different countries. And somehow it all comes together into, you know, your iPhone. It's really incredible when you think about it. And by the way, as always, we're using research from our global macro research and consulting firm, MacroOps. So since World War II, the trend has been towards more and more globalization. So more optimizing for where the costs are the lowest so that products could be cheaper for all of us. But in the last decade, international trade has actually leveled off. And now that relentless march towards globalization may now be reversing. So the new trend that we're talking about in this video that we all got to deal with is actually deglobalization. It will have major implications on economies, jobs, and consumers. And that's the major trend that we're going to talk about in this video. So that portion above that we're reading from is from Bank of America. And their research found that 80% of companies across 12 industries were rethinking parts of their supply chains, meaning they're thinking, huh, maybe we shouldn't have these factories over in China. Maybe we should bring it back. And according to the American Chamber of Commerce, they said exactly that. 40% of companies surveyed said they were considering relocating or had relocated manufacturing facilities outside China. So you can see in this chart right here, reshoring is accelerating. And this isn't exactly new. The actual globalization trend, it started slowing down 13 years ago. So supply chains that were getting wider and wider in terms of, you know, involving more and more countries, they started slowing down. So here's a bit about that from The Economist. The cost of moving goods stopped falling. Multinational firms found that global sprawl burned money and local rivals often ate them alive. And you know, that's often a question, like if you have a company like Uber that's going into every single country and they're so big, how are smaller startups even competing? Well, a lot of smaller startups, they focus specifically on their small area. And by doing that, they end up performing much better than the bigger company that is in all these different countries. So this is very true that local rivals usually eat them alive. Companies are shifting their activity towards services, which are harder to sell across borders. Like if you're trying to sell scissors, yeah, you can export that in 20 foot containers, but hairstylists, no. And that's kind of a feature of growing economies too. The economies go through cycles. They start as an agricultural economy, then they move into industrial, and then they move into services. So something like the US, we're at that services level. China currently is moving into that services level. Over the past few decades though, they were more industrial. And we'll actually talk about how those industrial booms affected this globalization and how the fact that we are not having many more is causing this deglobalization now, but that's coming in a minute. Global trade relative to GDP has been in decline since the Great Recession. We're now firmly on the backside of a 60 year up cycle in global trade growth. So you can see right here from 1947 to 2008, there was a lot more global trade going on and now the trend is reversing lower. Now, when we're looking at such a large trend like globalization and trade, they're really like slow cycles, kind of like demo demographics. If a country has great demographics, then yeah, that is going to be amazing for the next few decades. But also you got to wait a little for it to kick in. Alex, our head researcher, he put in a quote from C.S. Lewis here, who said, isn't it funny how day by day nothing changes, but when you look back, everything's different. So over the next decade for us, the world will change subtly, then incredibly fast. So trade cycles like the ones we're talking about typically correlate to developing country investment cycles. So when you need a bunch of steel and cement and stuff to build, when a country is rapidly developing, you know, that affects global trade. So over over the last century and a half, we've experienced three major urbanization investment cycles. The US at the start of the 19th century, Japan post-World War II, and China over the last few decades. So as you can see in this chart right here, that fueled a lot of the globalization. But we're unlikely to get another one of those anytime soon. KKR says that they do not believe any of the large emerging countries have the ability to urbanize as rapidly as the aforementioned countries. So we're kind of in a lull period for countries urbanizing. It's going to be a while, which isn't good for globalization. Geopolitical strategy strategist Peter Zeehan brings up another point, and I think it's pronounced Zeehan. He calls it the end of the order. So he said the post-1945 era of peace and prosperity was a historical aberration, meaning it's not common in history. It was only made possible by an American-led system of trade and alliances. That's what he calls the order. So this hegemonic system, supported by the full might of the U.S. Navy, is what provided the security needed for decades of progress in health, education, democracy, and peaceful international relations. But nowadays, Americans are turning inwards. They're tired of supplying the 
blood and money needed to maintain peace and order in far off lands? How long have we been in the Middle East? How much money do we give to governments that directly support terrorism? We do some crazy things. Americans realize though that we have more than enough problems to occupy us at home, which is why this whole period of peace and prosperity off of American backs has come to an end. So Zihan thinks we're reverting back to our global historical norm, one that's marked with collapsing markets, escalating conflicts over food and energy, and greater power struggles over maritime supremacy and territorial borders. So nothing nice here. So according to Zihan, there really is not supposed to be this much peace and prosperity. There's supposed to be more fighting. But you know, as rational optimists at Macarops, we hope he's being a bit too fatalistic. But if you look at history, yeah, that is a good possibility. And if you look at all the trends and the themes that we're tracking, yeah, it is pointing more in that direction. Hopefully not as bad as what he's saying though. There are other factors at work though that are causing deglobalization. For example, emerging markets, they're getting deeper financial markets, meaning they could provide their own funding so they don't have to go overseas. There's been advancements in manufacturing, right? Like we got robots and 3D printing now. So the whole supply chain in a different country makes less and less sense if you could do it for a good price here. And it all becomes much less complicated. I mean, we kind of learned how screwed up supply chains can get during this whole pandemic, right? And that's the thing about globalization and these larger supply chains. They were very effective, but they were also very fragile. Because if one thing goes wrong, you know, it screws up the rest of the supply chain. But when you have everything reshored and brought home, it's a lot more robust. Which you know at Fallible, when we're talking about investment strategies, we always want something that's robust, like our momentum strategy, right? It's been working for hundreds of years and it'll continue to work, regardless of how the market changes and the economy changes and any of that. So that same principle of robustness is what you really want to apply to any system. It's got to be able to survive any chaos, which is always guaranteed. Chaos is more common than calm. So if we do move into a new order, there's a few different opinions on how it's going to work. Some people think we're moving towards a tripolar world, which is one dominated by the regionalization of the global economy. So everyone has their own portion where they just focus there. So that would be split between the US, China, and Europe. And others argue we're moving towards bipolarity, where the world will be divvied up between two major spheres of influence between US and China. Now, my opinion is that in all this analysis about China, people forget to mention the culture, which is really important. Think about US American culture. It dominates everything across the world. Or I shouldn't say dominates, but it permeates through everything. China's culture, though, not so much. You know, America is all about freedom and doing what you want, where the CCP is all about ultimate control. You're being watched at every moment and you better not say something wrong. So it's going to be tough for that type of mentality to get popular. And I know this sounds like a small thing, but culture is a big thing. But anyway, that's a different video. So given this big trend of deglobalization, how exactly do you play it? What do you do with your money? What do you do with your stocks? Well, one of our favorite plays is Mexico. Mexico is going to be a huge hub for all the manufacturing that comes back to North America. You can see here from Bank of America again, manufacturing is moving back to North America after a hiatus of three decades. So a lot of that, again, going to Mexico. Our super positive buddy Zihan here points out that the existing integration between Mexico and the United States already makes for the world's busiest manufacturing, energy, financial, and passenger transfer border. So this is how Mexico became America's largest trading partner in 2019. And that's a title that's unlikely to be supplanted within our lifetime. So that's going to stick around. And over the last few decades, Mexico has built itself into a manufacturing powerhouse. Zihan says Mexico is the most trade intensive Latin American country by a factor of three. And over 80% of its exports are manufactured goods with nearly all of its products flowing north. That's to us. And that's kind of why Mexico will get a huge benefit from all this reshoring that's happening. They are one of the most favored locations for US based companies looking to move their operations out of China. And that's another thing that's kind of fueling this deglobalization. It's just the problems with China. As more and more people realize how bad the CCP is and the terrible things that they do, there's going to be more and more pressure on these companies to get out of there. An example recently is H&M. They put out one statement because they had a lot of pressure about the Uyghurs, right, in the concentration camps over there. They put out one statement and China pretty much banned them. So it's always a tricky relationship with the CCP because they're terrible. So Mexico has one of the best demographic profiles of any country in the world with 28% of its populace under the age of 14. And that's what you want in a country, a lot of young people. When you got a lot of old people, you got a problem because the young people got to support the old people. You rather have a bunch of working young people. So Mexico is good in that area. Wages are even lower in Mexico than in China. In Mexico, you pay $3.95 an hour versus $4.50 an hour in China. Not to mention the peso is cheap and trade terms between Mexico and US under the new USMCA are extremely favorable. Now, as far as which Mexican companies you could play for this trend, we've actually mentioned a few in these past videos that we've done. One of them, if you remember, was Better Wear Mexico, BWMX. It's up 21% since our purchase. Another one is Qualitas, ticker symbol Q. It's up 5% since our purchase. But these stocks have a long way to go. Now, another way to play the long-term Mexico bull trade 
trade is through its currency, which we noted, you know, the peso is very cheap. It's also the highest yielding major currency. It's also one of the cheapest on a purchasing power parity basis. You can see here on this percent undervalued, the Mexican peso is way down there. And from a technical perspective, you could see that the currency is recovering from its COVID lows. It's forming a reverse head and shoulders pattern here. This is likely the start of a major bull trend, especially because the dollar is entering a bear trend. Now, Mexico has been beaten down along with the rest of Latin America by a third wave of this COVID virus over the last few months. But Biden is about to send millions of vaccine doses to both Canada and Mexico soon, which is no doubt a sign of the U.S.'s commitment to what will become an even more important political and economic partnership between these three neighbors. Because us North Americans are all together basically now, right? If all our manufacturing is coming back here, if there's going to be separate spheres, we better be real friendly with Canada and Mexico. So we definitely want to be long the peso and Mexican assets. And we can take a closer look here at the two stocks that we mentioned that we're already in. You can see better where to Mexico is recovering and is close to breaking up above its 50 day moving average right here. And if it does that, that's a good potential entry point because you could cut off your risk right where the average is. It's a good support level. You can see since we mentioned it, it's already had a great run. Since my previous video, when I drew that little triangle right there, it's up 128%. That's when I was doing my three stocks videos that sometimes you guys like, sometimes you hate it. So, so you know, I just stopped doing them. Actually, when I did the better where to Mexico video, everyone hated the company, said it was a Ponzi scheme as if they knew anything about it. That was so weird. Just because these Tupperware companies might be more of a scam in the US doesn't mean that they're the same thing in Mexico. They're different cultures. Things work differently. You could just tell by what happened to the prices here. So just remember when you're analyzing stocks in different countries, things work differently. But don't worry, this trend is not over. Like I said, there may be an opportunity right here when it breaks past this resistance. And so it will become a support. That'd be a good area to enter. Now, Qualitas here is not on an American exchange, but if you have access to foreign stocks, that's great. It really opens up your universe. But the same thing is kind of happening. You're getting an opportunity to enter on this little pullback right here. But this is a very, very strong chart, as you can see. Now, if you're playing any of these stocks or these trends, there is something really important that you need to do. And we made a video about it right here, especially with the way the markets are moving with this deglobalization, you're going to want to focus on this a lot. It is going to save you a lot of money. So click this video right here and I will see you there.